What is up, A Push Peeps? Welcome to our week five core content video. Uh, week five is going to be a really big week for us as we are going to talk through the first two systems of government that uh, the United States creates. First, the Articles of Confederation, a short lived, much maligned uh, dumpster fire of a system that is in short order replaced by the U.S. Constitution which is where we'll spend our live session and our extension session for this week. However, despite the fact that the Articles of Federation are largely deemed a failure by history, this system of government still is incredibly important for our understanding of how and why political institutions and economic institutions are built the way that they are going forward. Uh, so just as we contextualize today's conversation, it's important that we note how and why a, a weak and failed system of government might be created. Uh, and this all comes out of the fears of the people post-revolutionary war. Now, because of this, this generally negative experience with King George III and parliamentary sovereignty uh, from 1763 through 1776 and the Declaration of Independence, there's this general fear amongst the American people of tyranny, of centralized authority. Now, as you know from our period two and our early period three studies, the Americans prefer government to be small, to be localized, to be close to home, and to be responsive to the demands of the people. And while the Articles of Federation don't exactly do that as a system of government, it is important to note uh, this, this overwhelming fear of tyranny and how it shapes the systems of government that are built here in the very early republic. Now, I want to make a couple things clear to begin. Uh, first, your notes, your, your note catcher uh, here uh, is also, of course, posted in Google Classroom for you. I tried to make it very straightforward uh, with the, the really big key ideas, key terms, and key events of today's uh, conversation. So make sure you follow along on your note catcher. Uh, part two or note two, if you will, uh, please, be, uh, please ensure that you take the short quote-unquote quiz. It's not really a quiz. It's a me checking to make sure that you're understanding the key ideas from today's video. Uh, Google form submission, make sure that gets done uh, by end of day. Um, and like I told you the last couple weeks, this is a, a week in which I have zero time, we have zero time to rehash the things in this video. Uh, live in our sessions on Tuesday and Thursday. So that doesn't mean that I, there won't be space for you to ask questions about this video, but don't expect that you can breeze through this video, not pay much attention, and it will be fine because you'll hear about it again on Tuesday and Thursday because a push just will no longer, we no longer have the pacing uh, uh, flexibility given the constraints of this distance learning schedule uh, to be revisiting things live that you should have watched on Monday. Uh, so please give this video your full undivided attention. Um, and let's begin. Now we know, we know from last week uh, about this, this, this slow march towards independence from 1763 that really began with the proclamation line of 1763, meant to constrain the colonists' expansion, keep them on the coast uh, under the watchful eye of the uh, British Empire. Uh, we know the key turning points that get us closer to independence, things like the Stamp Act Congress and things like uh, the, the Boston Tea Party and the subsequent Intolerable Acts, right? Things like Common Sense by Thomas Paine. So those things are all really important because understanding those big turning points that pushed more Americans towards independence uh, help us understand the how and why they put the institutions in place that they did after independence. So today's lecture is titled Governing the New Nation. Uh, and we're going to govern the new nation uh, in two ways, really. Uh, the Articles of Confederation is, of course, the first national government uh, of the United States. Uh, but each state will also have its own constitution that we need to uh, dive into, not all 13 of them necessarily, but some characteristics that are important to understand uh, at the state constitutional level. So uh, those are our two foci of today. Uh, we'll end with Shays' Rebellion as a big turning point uh, towards the desire for a stronger national government. Uh, but our outline looks like this. First, we'll spend some time on state governments and localized power, which, as you know, is the much preferred version of power uh, here in the 1780s. We'll talk ourselves through the structures, the actual uh, governance of the Articles of Confederation. We'll talk about a couple of short successes. 
We'll talk more so about the shortcomings of, of governance, of the execution of political power under the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and we'll end today with Shays' Rebellion as, as really the, the linchpin event, the big turning point event uh, that gets more Americans on board with the idea of a more strengthened, uh, powerful national government to solve some of the problems. Right? So what are the consequences of creating a system in which authority is very limited? So a question that I want to pose to you uh, as we begin is, is this, this issue of liberty versus order. I think of liberty, I think of like freedoms, uh, be able to make your own choices, be able to do your own thing without any constraints from the government versus order, which is stability and structure and systems. So if we have a, a society in which you have too much liberty, right? if you have too much liberty, then, then what are we living in? Right? It might be nice for you to be able to do whatever the heck you want, but if everybody can do whatever the heck they want, then what kind of world are we living in? Right, that's one end of, of the of the spectrum, right? Way over here on the, the far side of things. Meanwhile, if we have a society that has too much order, too much structure, too much power in the hands of the government to tell you what to do, that's probably not good either. So one of the things to think through today is the need for balance. The need for balance. And how do you properly balance the need for liberty, for freedoms for the people, but also the need for, for social stability across the board. Um, and, and this is a hard balance to strike. Uh, if you had asked the colonists in 1776, they would have said that they're living in a system that had too much order, right? Too much power. The king would just tell them what to do too much. So anytime we have in society a change, we usually go from one extreme to the other. All right? So we might maybe we're going to go from a system in which the, the colonists, the new Americans would have said that was too much order but then often we overcorrect, and what comes next is a system in which there's too much liberty. Right? Uh, I think about when we break up with somebody, right? Like high schoolers, like I broke up with that person because of X, Y, and Z. So then whatever those reasons may be, what you look for in your next boyfriend or girlfriend is the actual opposite. Well, maybe in reality what you need to find is something in the middle. Or just stay single and happy forever because, you know, you can do that too. Right? Don't let me tell you what to do. So that's how we begin this question of liberty versus order. Um, good line that I always appreciate uh, comes out of a Philadelphia newspaper during the Revolutionary War. And it poses the question, poses the question, which one of us should be the rulers? Right? And I love this question, right? Because it, it implies the idea that nobody knows what the heck, heck's going on, right? They're looking around like, okay, cool, we're about to be independent from England, but who's in charge? Are you in charge? Are you? I'm a I'm not in charge. Are they? Are they in charge? All right, so the word in here that I always uh, uh, find optimistic is us, right? This idea that we get to rule, but also we don't know what we're doing. And I think that's important to note, right? The first time you do anything, uh, it's it's often a failure, and that's okay. Right? The first time you ride your bike, right? You fall down, right? you cry, you scrape your knee, you get up, maybe you try it again. The first time you make a new recipe, right? If you don't have directions to follow, if I just told you go make cookies and you're like, oh, okay, let me put a little sugar, maybe some flour and an egg, I don't know, bake it. Right? If you don't have directions on how to do something, then the first time you do anything is, is likely going to be a failure. And in this case, that's, that holds true for the, for the American experiment as well. And that they are independent of England, uh, thanks to the Treaty of Paris 1783, but don't exactly know what to do next because nobody's ever done this before. Nobody's ever put in place a, a broad national government on Republican principles. I'm going to use that phrase a lot today, Republican principles. And what that simply means is the principle of representative government, that we pick our representatives and they make decisions on our behalf. Okay? So nobody's ever done this before. We can't check online for the ingredients. We can't go look up how to do it. We can't go ask some other experts that have had some success in this field because really the United States experiment is the first attempt on a large scale to create a Republican government. And much like you on a bike or me making cookies without a recipe, the first time you do it, it fails. So the Revolutionary War, and not just the war, but the whole revolutionary era, the whole process by which independence came about, led to some key unintended social changes uh, because of the, the ideals of the revolution forcing Americans to question what it means to have a society of equality, right? Who does equality apply to? Does it apply to women? 
Does it apply to all? Does it apply to across the races? Does it apply to poor people, right? Um, so we see some significant changes as, as Americans are going to work to eliminate any, any idea that resembles an American aristocracy or an American uh, class-based system in which the rich have all the power. Uh, we're going to see, as we talked about at the tail end of last week's live session, that fighting against British tyranny makes slavery seem hypocritical. Makes the idea of owning humans seem contradictory to the American values of, of equality, which is going to lead to some significant growth in what becomes known as the abolitionist movement, which will, will ebb and flow uh, for the next 80 years until the Civil War uh, actually ends up abolishing slavery. Uh, and we see women gaining increased status uh, through an ideology that's called Republican motherhood that I'll talk through here in just a second. So we see in this, this post-revolutionary era that, that even black people, uh, even some of those who were enslaved, are going to um, begin demanding their rights to freedom. They're going to start signing petitions, asking for inclusion in society, uh, filing lawsuits, some of which are successful in, in New England states, uh, to, to gain their freedom through the, through the judicial process. Um, so, so black Americans are, are working within the constraints uh, and the systems that are being put in place post-revolution to start demanding that they get included in the American process. Uh, on the idea of eliminating this American quote-unquote aristocracy, we see most states uh, lowering property qualifications to vote, meaning allowing even people that own a small amount of property or, or pay a small amount of tax uh, to vote, but no state is going to go so far as to offer universal across-the-board male suffrage. Uh, we'll see that as much more of a uh, uh, Jacksonian era, 1820s, 30s, and 40s development, but we'll get there when we get there in period four. But it's important to note that by letting more, more social classes of people participate in politics, you've made democracy more democratic by including more uh, players in the process. Uh, key, key founding generation leaders like Benjamin Franklin and John Jay, who we talked about a lot last week, both of them, uh, and Alexander Hamilton, who we'll talk about a lot next week, are going to participate in abolitionist societies, groups working to end slavery. Uh, even Washington, the first president, is going to manumit his slaves, uh, which is a fancy way of saying setting his slaves free when he dies, uh, which again doesn't do much good, um, doesn't really... Make him doesn't really cast him in much of a heroic light, but it does demonstrate that people are grappling with the questions of slavery. Uh, the states that we talked about last week are going to abolish slavery, which is a, a, a big step, uh, historically speaking. Uh, and then the ideas of Republican motherhood are going to be placed upon women. Uh, that that their women are are entrusted with the very important task of raising the next generation of Republican leaders, of leaders in a representative government to take on the legacy of the American Revolution. And thus, it is a woman's job to instill virtue and knowledge and civic mindedness in their children, which of course we would not consider is a, a very uh, progressive role for women by 2020 standards, very true. Uh, it does in fact um, lead to a more respectful place in society for a woman's contribution uh, from the domestic sphere uh, to the nation's success. And most states are also going to very specifically and clearly separate church and state, again, reflecting the revolutionary principles um, and ensuring that we don't have state-supported churches like we did with the Church of England uh, so that there's no tax money going specifically to a denomination of churches, but instead that people can choose their own, uh, uh, choose your own adventure religious-wise, religiously, excuse me. So that's some of our changes. What also is important as a shift is this emphasis on the new states' constitutions. Now, in 1776, the Second Continental Congress is going to encourage each state, all 13 of them. Uh, we've shifted now from colonies to states with independence. Um, and each state to create a written constitution, uh, which they write out all the important things that are their structure of government in that state. Uh, these state constitutions are going to very clearly define citizens' rights. They're going to emphasize, like, these are the rights that people have. And each constitution is going to take great lengths to limit how much power the government has because there's, again, this fear that giving the government too much power leads to tyranny. Okay, so each state is going to um, lay out the, the key rights they believe each citizen should have and what the government can't take away. Uh, these state constitutions are going to take great steps to guarantee natural rights across the board, 
Eight of the 13 are going to include a written bill of rights, the right to free speech, the right to free press, uh, the media, the right to petition the government, the right to like, gather together to protest peacefully. Uh, all those things uh, are going to be present in these state constitutions, which reflects what, what the priorities of each state are in this during and post-revolutionary war era. And across the board, almost every one of the states is going to put very little power in the hands of the state's governor, who we see as like the executive, the, not king, but like the president of the state, if you will. Almost every state is going to make that governor position very weak because they don't like the idea of one person having too much power. And they're going to make their state's legislative body, where they pick their representatives that represent uh, the constituencies of the people, they're going to make that legislative uh, body much more powerful because it much more closely reflects the will of the people. So we see here these state constitutions are doing a good job of ensuring that the people have the power in mass, right? And that, that where the people have the most say is the legislative body because each little you know, district or town or city is going to elect their representative. And that legislative body has the most authority. Thus, the people have the most say over how the government carries out its business. Now, Pennsylvania is one example, maybe the most liberal or the most uh, democratic of the examples. The Pennsylvania Constitution is going to create a unicameral legislature, which means one house, one body of people that is making all the laws, all the legislative decisions. But this one house is going to have complete power. Right? There's no check on this house's power because uh, there's no governor uh, to, to slow them down or to, to counterweigh them, like the separation of powers ideology. Um, Pennsylvania is going to create uh, state-funded elementary level education so that everybody in Pennsylvania can get education, right? If we're going to give the people all the power, we should then give the people the tools to ha for how to execute that power with, with, with intelligence and, and sound decision-making. And there's no property requirement to, to serve in this uh, uh, state legislature, meaning that anybody can be elected to go serve Pennsylvania um, in their state legislative body. Which, again, is, is extreme for the day. Uh, John Adams is going to look at this and say, whoa, 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 this is way too much democracy. This is too much power in the hands of the people. Uh, of course, it doesn't matter to Pennsylvania because John Adams lives in Massachusetts. So they're like, cool, man. Thanks for your feedback. Head your ass back to Massachusetts. Um, but this is a good example of, of a state constitution that reflects this revolutionary principle of limited government and power in the hands of the people. Now that's the state level constitutions that are important to note. The challenges then become how do you create a national government, a government that, that governs for the whole new nation um, despite the fact that all of our states are so different, the different economies, different social structures, different priorities, different denominations of Christianity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you create a national government that meets everybody's needs, that everybody's happy with? How do you balance these three important things? First, how do you balance individual liberty Freedom of individuals to do what they want, while also maintaining a stable and ordered society. All right? Like, if we get everybody the power to drive 140 miles an hour, that seems cool if you want to drive really fast, but that puts all people around you in danger. All right? So how do you balance that need for individual freedom, but also the need for, for a stable society? Uh, I, I would argue that this is still uh, a, a juggling act that we are still uh, conducting today in society. Second... How do you balance property rights and, and those that have like the most property with the need to still have a system based on equality? Um, you know, this is more of a like, a like a rich versus poor type of balance situation that it's important. Uh, and third, all right, the real the real like big foundation of these questions is how do you create a centralized government, a government that, that has power over the whole country without creating tyrannical authority? So how do you give the government power, but also give the government not too much power? Right? What's the proper balance? And then how, how do you check the government from getting too strong, too powerful? And the solution, the first attempted solution, not a solution at all because it solves very little, but the first attempted solution is the Articles of Confederation. It's the name of the first government in the United States of America, first national government. Now, at the beginning of the war, the Second Continental Congress, who's the group that declares independence and conducts the war effort, and then ratifies the Articles or approves the Articles of Confederation. They urge, as I told you a little bit ago, every state to make their own constitution and each state to almost run itself like its own little country. Uh, the states are, are told you should oppose or go against everything that leans to an aristocratic society or power in the hands of the rich. 
and build your systems so that power is distributed amongst the people. And thus, the Articles of Confederation uh, is established in 1777, so one year after uh, declaring independence. Uh, it's not, a, not ratified or approved by the states until 1781, uh, which as you know, because you're all very smart English students, uh, is two years before the Treaty of Paris is signed, which ends the Revolutionary War. And the Articles is going to serve as America's first national government. Now, the Articles of Confederation is a very, 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 very weak national government. And that's not an accident. That is intentional. The Articles is designed to be weak because in this time period, keep this in mind because it's going to shift by the end of today by tomorrow's and Thursday's live sessions. In this time period, the new Americans, their biggest fear was tyranny. Their biggest fear was an overexpansion, overexpansive, too powerful federal government. So they created a system that was the exact opposite of that. Right? A limited, very structured, very, very, very reined in national government because their fear was the opposite. So the Articles are going to establish a very intentionally weak central government and leave almost all the power at the state level for the states to almost run themselves like their own little nation. Each state is treated as a pseudo or a semi-nation doing its own thing and, and running its own state like its own little country. Okay. Now, next structural piece is the Confederation-style government is going to give all 13 of the states one vote in this National Congress uh, that will be a unicameral, a one one house, one branch government. So, so this legislative assembly that meets, Virginia gets one vote, New York gets a vote, Pennsylvania gets a vote, South Carolina gets a vote, Georgia gets, all 13 states get one vote. All right, and this is gonna upset some of the more populous or larger states, because they're like, why does Rhode Island with like 800 people have as many votes as Virginia with, with you know tens of thousands of people? That doesn't seem right. So one, one vote per state on all legislative issues, and there's no president, there's no executive, there's no um, uh, individual person to execute the law, um, and they, they have no national president because it looks too much like a king, too much like a monarch, and they don't like that idea. You know, it's too similar to a monarch. Now, the Articles of Confederation are empowered to do very few things. Uh, they are, are given the power to settle disputes among states, right, if South Carolina's pissed at Georgia, uh, over some sort of dispute or some sort of disagreement, the national government can step in and help solve that problem. That's one thing they can do. Cool. Second, they can negotiate treaties, like the Treaty of Paris, 1783, official agreements with other countries. Uh, we don't see like our states, individual states, making treaties, but the national government makes treaties with other countries. Third thing they are empowered to do is to handle uh, all Indian affairs, all problems or negotiations with, with Native American tribes. And the fourth power that this government is given is the uh, power to oversee a military, which seems logical for a national government to do. However, what it can't do, one of the main, main issues that it can't do is it can't tax. Right? The national government can't tax the citizens and can't tax the states. And again, this reflects the fear of taxation, the fear of centralized power over taxes that is demonstrated in our response to uh, British parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, the Articles can only request contribution from the state. Like, please, can you send us some money? And most of the states are like, yeah, no, not going to happen. The next two structural pieces are important because they're going to really make things hard to change. First, any new law, any new law passed by this uh, uh, governing body for the whole country needs nine out of 13 states, which is considered a super majority because, of course, seven would have been a majority of 13. Uh, so that makes it hard to pass laws because it's hard to get nine of the states on board. And amending the, which, uh, the amendment process or to change the actual structure of the government, to give the government new powers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, needs all 13 states to agree. So if we're going to say like, man, we really should have given the government the power to tax, let's add that in, you would need to get all 13 states on board to do that, which is incredibly difficult because if I, if, I if I asked 13 of you, what do you want for lunch? It has to be unanimous. You have to all agree. It would probably never happen because there's always one or two people who are like, no, I don't, I don't want that. I hate that. Or I'm allergic to that. Or I can't eat that. I don't eat that. All right? So then getting 13 states on board with like changing the government is next to impossible. Now, in a sense, the articles are created to really loosely tie the states together. 
Um, they it isn't necessarily designed to be a, a an expansive, robust federal government. Instead, it's it's, an, it's a league of friendship, if you will, uh, amongst all thirteen states that are really kind of left alone to do their own thing. Now, there, there's some some significant weaknesses that we'll discuss as we go. First, the national government is just incredibly powerless. Uh, Congress has no power to tax. Uh, problem one: Congress can't even regulate trade amongst the states within the same country, meaning. If South Carolina wants to put a huge tax on all goods from North Carolina, they can, even though they're all technically part of the same country. So we see the states competing with each other aggressively on economic issues, and the national government can't step in and regulate that because they don't have that power. Next problem, uh, there's no power for, it to, for any sort of common currency to be created, money, uh, meaning the, there's no U.S. dollars that are regulated and set to help establish um, economic stability. Uh, New York has their own dollars. Massachusetts has their own dollars. What's a New York dollar worth compared to Massachusetts dollar compared to a South Carolina dollar compared to a Georgia dollar? Who knows? Figure it out. I, I have often asked this question in class of, of what's a dollar worth? Right? What is a dollar worth? You got a dollar in your pocket? What's it worth? It's worth a dollar? It's worth a hundred cents? It's worth four quarters? Sure. No. A dollar is worth what you can get for it. It's economic wisdom from which. A dollar is worth what you can get for it. So if all of our, these dollars are worth different things, then how do you really regulate currency across the entire country? Uh, additionally, uh, the whole one state, one vote problem is, is problem, problematic because it doesn't account for states that have different populations. Uh, and there is no executive, meaning a president or a governor, some sort of like person to execute or enforce the law, uh, and there's no judicial branch, a national court system. Each state has their own court systems to do their own things. So really, it's kind of the Wild West out there because all the power is left at the state level, but again, that is intentional. That is on purpose. Now, there are two really important successes that are worth knowing of the Articles of Confederation's government, uh, and both of them are going to deal with what's called the Northwest Territory, the Northwest Territory. And it's this area out on the frontier, past the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, it is where, for example, Pontiac's Rebellion happened in 1763, which caused the British to then put in place the proclamation line to keep the colonists from spreading out. So it's land that matters a lot to the Americans because they wanted it in the first place. It's one of the things that caused the Revolutionary War. Um, and it's this area that's north of the Ohio River and east of the Mississippi River. Right? And it's the, in the northwest portion of the country at the time. Like now in our country, the northwest portion is like Oregon and Washington, just north of California, right? But at the time, this is as far north and as far west as the nation went. So this is called the Northwest Territory, okay? So land settlement. How to settle this land in the Northwest Territory is really the only big success of the Articles of Confederation. And this may not sound important, and in some ways it's not, um, but... What happens here is going to be really important for creating precedent, creating an example for how to do things in the future for settling new territory. Because if you look at the U.S. map today, compared to 1783, it obviously looks very different. And this precedent that is created here is going to be used and applied to the rest of the land that the U.S. is going to acquire over the course of the next 150 years. So the first law that we consider a success is the Land Ordinance of 1785, right? Problem, government needs money. Problem two, government can't tax. Therefore, how are they going to gain money? Right? Enter Land Ordinance 1785, which sells this land to settlers that want to spread out, sells this land so that the government has a little bit of money to conduct its business, right? To pay its officials to do its thing. So this land west of the Appalachian Mountains, which are right in here along the side of the Ohio River, the Proclamation Line, think of that. Settlers that want to spread out to this land can buy land from the federal government, and that gives the government money for land, and it gives people opportunity to get new land. It's a win-win, win-win-win, win all around. Um, and it establishes guidelines for, like, each community has to save a little space for a school. Uh, each community can have X amount of people, and then once you have more people can become a state, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the follow-up to this is called the Northwest Ordinance, also dealing with the Northwest Territory, same land. 
Uh, and that's going to set up a, an orderly system of settlement, meaning once you have 15,000 people in any chunk of this land, you can apply to be a formal territory, which is like the halfway stage between unsettled and a new state. Once you have 60,000 people, then you can apply to be a state. That's exciting. Uh, this is exciting, actually, because all the states that existed, the 13 original states, thought they might be able to gather this land on the interior as like colonies of their state. And the Articles of Confederation says, no, 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 we're not going to go down this colony route. When we get new land and we settle that land, then th those new areas will be considered states and equal with everybody else in the rest of the states. So in that case, it's going to strongly encourage westward expansion by ensuring people that when they spread out, they would still be members in the American nation as if they were uh, in a state that had already been established. So it establishes the process for territories to become states. Right, 60,000 people, you get to become a state. That's cool. And it bans slavery. It's the first time the national government is going to say, no, you can't have slavery here. So all this land north of the Ohio River is going to be, as it gets settled, as it gets established, as people move out there, can't take slaves. Slaves will not exist in the Northwest Territory. Slavery is outlawed. Big deal. Now here's the national government stepping up and, and, and refusing to allow slavery to expand north of the Ohio River. It also states that this area will eventually contain no less than three and no more than five new states. And we end up eventually getting five states out of this deal. Ohio comes into the Union first. Once they get 60,000 people, uh, then Illinois, uh, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin are to follow. And then much, much later, a little bit of Minnesota uh, actually takes over part of this area as well. And this is what I'm talking about. Look at this map. All right. So here's our original 13 states that were colonies. Now they're states after independence. And they're all going to be claiming land as their own out here on the frontier. Like Virginia, Virginia is going to claim this land for themselves, this land for themselves, way the heck up here, this land for themselves. This land here in the middle, Massachusetts and Virginia claim belong to them. This land right here, my mouse is, is claimed by Connecticut and Virginia. And I'm like, Connecticut, you're way the heck over here. What are you doing claiming land way over here? But these states are thinking that they're going to just expand, expand, expand their state because each state is functioning like its own little country. And this is when the Articles of Confederation government steps in and says, no, you have your state boundaries. All this new land will become new states that will be equal to all the other states uh, and have the same sorts of representation and the like. Okay, so uh, what it does, though, is it makes the Ohio River here this boundary between no slaves and slaves. So the significance of the, the, this, both of these laws that deal with the Northwest Territory, the Land Ordinance and the Northwest Ordinance, uh, is it allows for a much more structured and orderly settlement of Western territories that will not become colonies or simply expansions of existing states. One pro, slavery is outlawed. That's a big deal. It's a big step. Second pro, uh, the law itself uh, allows for education, public education in the states, and ensuring that each community that's built up saves a plot of land for a local school. Uh, and it creates systems for democracy in that the states will end up with the same sort of representative rights as any other states would and thus encourages westward expansion. Now, two significant cons, though, is it creates a dividing line between no slaves and slaves. Now, in this case, by stating no slavery will exist north of the Ohio River, you are implying then that slavery is allowed to expand south of the Ohio River. And that's exactly what happens. As, as Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgian slave owners are going to move west in search of larger plots of land, that's going to be sped up in the uh, eight, late 1790s and early 1800s by the cotton boom, which is going to push slavery further south and further west. Uh, but this Ohio River divide remains a geographic line in the sand, so to speak, between the non-slave expansion states and the slave expansion states. Second con is by creating this whole system in place, you have invalidated any existing Native American claims to the land that may have been given to them via treaty by the British government or by individual colonies uh, in response for them moving out of the way as the, the colonies first began to expand. So you've invalidated these claims uh, and ensured that Native Americans do not have a seat at the table in, in the discussions regarding land in the new republic. So that's the two successes. 
Let's talk about the problems. Problem one is the economy. The economy sucks. The economy is terrible. And the Articles of Confederation government is not really given the power to do the things that would be needed to fix the economy, so the economy is going to keep sucking. During the war itself, the colonial boycotts we talked about, right, the Sons of Liberty and boycotting British goods and boycotting British goods and boycotting British goods, ends up hurting trade in the long run, obviously. Uh, everybody expects the economy to get better after the war. Like, oh, we can trade with France and Spain and all that. But the colonists don't, didn't really realize that, that a, even in an independent world, most of their business would have come from England. And now England's pissed because we declared independence and won the war. And now England doesn't want to trade with us either or buy our goods either. So in that sense, uh, the American economy is having a hard time. Uh, Congress can't pay off the huge war debt that Congress has because wars are expensive. Because they can't collect taxes. They can request money from the states, but they can't demand money from the states. So that we have a huge national debt that will never get paid off because we can't tax people to pay for it. Uh, there's a ton of inflation. A ton of inflation which happens because the government prints a ton of money to try to pay for this debt. But when a ton of money is in circulation, then your money is, is worth less because there's more money around and circulating. And that's what's called – so prices have to go up uh, to account for the huge supply of money. Uh, the way I explain it often in class is like what if – you got a million dollars. Wouldn't that be great? And everyone's like, yeah, that's awesome. Now, what if every single person had a million dollars? Then we're right back where we started because we all got a million dollars and we can't do anything with it because everybody has a million dollars. So that's the problem with inflation is there's way too much money in circulation. Uh, and finally, because of mercantilism, because the economy was so constrained by England to just produce raw materials, um, it becomes very challenging for the Americans to create a favorable balance of trade because they consistently have to buy things from manufactured goods from other countries, which of course are more expensive. So then we're stuck in this cycle in which we're dependent on other nations economically. So the U.S. has about $40 million in war debt at the end of the war, which is a lot of money. Uh, and the Congress can't ease this national debt, can't begin paying off this national debt because they can't tax. So the solution is to print a bunch of money and currency to pay off this debt. But that leads to massive inflation, uh, and, and then people that are owed money are demanding that they're paid back their money not based on what was lent, but like what that is worth now, which is a much higher value. So it, it's this, this debt taxes inflation cycle um, that, that Congress can't really get out of because they're not given the tools and the powers to do the things that would fix this problem. Right, the government can request money from the states, but can't require states to send money. Um, and therefore, the economy is going to keep worsening. Trade problems are also going to exist both within the country and between the U.S. and other countries. Um, states themselves are going to begin putting tariffs, which is a very important term for APUSH. Tariff is an import tax, a tax you pay when you buy a good from somewhere else. Uh, but the, the funny thing is states are going to be putting tariffs on each other. Like South Carolina put a tariff on North Carolina. So North Carolina retaliates and puts a tariff on South Carolina. So now nobody's going to buy goods from other states, even though they're in the same country, because they don't want to pay the tariffs. And then the economy less gets traded, less gets bought, less gets sold. The economy still struggles. And because there's no real hard currency, which is like gold and silver, money that's not just on paper, but it's actually worth something, trade is difficult. Because I, I, I'm i going to pay with my Massachusetts dollars, and somebody in New York's like, well, I don't take those because I need New York dollars here in New York. So the lack of, of a uniform currency and the lack of hard currency makes trade very, very difficult. Two more things are going to happen that are, make things hard. First, uh, people still want British goods because British goods are better and cheaper than American goods. So people buy British goods, but then that hurts the American industries that are, are brand new, these little baby industries, because people are just going to buy British stuff anyway because it's cheaper because they've been doing it longer and they can mass produce things. So these new American industrial facilities, the building manufactured goods like textiles and cloth and furniture and the like, are going to be really struggling because people are still just buying their stuff from England because it's better, cheaper, and probably faster. Second, uh, England prohibits any of its Caribbean colonies, its colonies down in the Caribbean Sea like Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, the rest of the British Empire. They prohibit them from trading with the U.S. So a lot of those cash crops that were being Produced in the southern colonies like rice, indigo, tobacco, etc., even the middle colonies for like wheat and corn, um, 
the U.S. loses the place where it sold the most of them, England, because England's salty about the Revolutionary War. So the economy is, is a hot, hot mess. Uh, funny enough, Connecticut is charging a higher import tax on things made in Massachusetts than things made in England, which seems counterproductive and backwards, but that's a good example of states charging each other more money uh, than even other countries. Uh, this desire for cheap British goods is going to hurt American industries in the north, the, the northern states that are trying to industrialize. Uh, and England prohib prohibiting its Caribbean colonies from trading with the U.S. is going to really hurt southern planters. That's where they sell a lot of their cash crops, a lot of their goods. So things just suck across the board. Right? There's not a whole lot of good things going on. So one solution, one solution is, is posed by a group of, of nationalists that prefer a stronger national government. Um, and they create a constitutional amendment, which, as you know, needs all 13 states to agree. And this amendment is just going to create a uniform 5% import tax. So if we, anything that's imported from another country, there's a 5% tax on it. And that tax will go to the government. The government can use that tax to pay off its debt and start getting things in, in, in business. It will also create a national bank, this new amendment. And the national bank's going to regulate currency and make sure that our, our banking system is stable to try to build up some, some better economic stability. 12 out of the 13 states are going to agree, which is crazy. But a small group of localists that prefer small local government in Rhode Island, Rhode Island says, nope, we don't like that idea. We don't want that. And that kills the amendment. So it's this process that shows you can't even fix the problems of the Articles of Federation because one person's going to, one state's going to always disagree, uh, helps begin to convince people that maybe we need to just scrap the system altogether and start over. Because if we can't even address a very clear problem with a with a very simple solution, because one state disagrees, then maybe the problem is the whole system, not just parts of it. Uh, these nationalists are led by three really important names for our next couple weeks, Alexander Hamilton, uh, James Madison, and Robert Morris who are, are searching for ways to give the national government more power to try to address some of these problems. Okay. Hamilton's argument is that having a national debt isn't a bad thing as long as you can pay some of it back. Because as you're paying back your debt, you're building credit with other countries who are then just as eager to loan you more money and, and help the economy start getting on its feet. So that's the economic problems. There's also some significant foreign policy problems in the U.S. and other countries. And the articles are going to prove inadequate to handle those as well. First problem, uh, Americans do not pay back their debts to England and loyalists of the England of loyalists to England that lost their property during the war. Part of the Treaty of Paris says that America's going to pay them back and we don't pay those people back. So England says, cool. Uh, we'll just keep our troops in the Ohio Valley then, in that Northwest Territory, because uh, if you're not going to pay back your debts, then we're not going to hold up our end of the bargain um, and leave the United States. So the British just kind of leave their troops at forts in the Ohio Valley, which is where people are trying to spread out because of the Northwest Territory. What can the U.S. do about it? Nothing, because they can't pay an army because they can't tax and they have no money. So that's a problem. Uh, Spain also has some beef with us here. Uh, as, as the U.S. is trying to claim that we have more land in the South than, than that Spain claims is theirs. So they get mad at us and we haven't paid back our debts to them either. So they shut off access to the Mississippi River, which is a really important waterway for shipping goods that are created in the internal United States out to market. So that makes things really, really hard. Uh, and as we're trying to trade with countries uh, around the world, uh, specifically in Europe, uh, pirates – freaking pirates from Algeria uh, begin attacking uh, American ships and enslaving American merchants, uh, which is – and we can't send the Navy to go stop this to protect these ships because we don't have a Navy. So you can see that that all these problems stem from how, how limited the power of the national government is as our states themselves fighting amongst each other over who has access to different rivers to ship their goods out. That's my river. No, that's my river. So it's a hot, hot mess. And the Articles has nothing really they can do to fix it. Congress and the Army are too weak to resist. We don't have a Navy to go solve the trade problems. It's just kind of a mess. John Jay uh, negotiates a treaty with Spain called the Jay Gardagai Treaty. Uh, but actually that gets met with regional resistance uh, who think that we're not getting given enough land in the southern territory with, uh, with Spain. 
And that gets rejected in Congress as well. And that would have opened access to the Mississippi River and, and solved some of the economic problems. So as you can see, like things just aren't going very well. And what ends up actually being the spark that pushes people over the edge is actually going to be called Shays Rebellion. Shays Rebellion. That's going to be about a year and a half period of chaos in Massachusetts uh, in 1786 and 1787. That'll be a large turning point uh, towards Americans accepting the idea that a stronger national government is needed. There's a lot of tensions, right? Tension one, that Jay Gardakai Treaty that gets rejected, which would have given the U.S. at least access to the Mississippi River to ship goods. That gets rejected. Uh, New England, the region of New England, right? Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Connecticut, Rhode Island, the, the northeastern states are in a significant depression uh, because their economy is largely built on shipping and trade and we're not really shipping or trading with many people. So things are kind of hard for New England. Um, because of, of living under the mercantile policies of England for all those years, uh, the, call, the Americans' industrial capacity is very limited, which makes the economy really reliant still on other countries, which hurts. Um, and even the beginnings of early American industrialization can't keep up with foreign manufacturing. who have been doing it longer and thus more efficient, so that hurts. Uh, and the states themselves are either unable to pay back their debts or just refusing to pay back their debts, uh, which is also really hurting American credibility in other countries. Add that up to the fact that we don't really have an army or navy to keep things safe. And as you can see, society is very free. People can do whatever the hell they want, but there's not really any order. There's no real structures uh, and systems in place to keep things stable. Now, the problems are going to begin in Massachusetts. As the farmers in Massachusetts, the small farmers are in some serious debt problems. And because they're in debt, the officials in Massachusetts are beginning to foreclose or, or take away their farms because they can't pay back their debts. Now, many of these men are actually former Revolutionary War soldiers, uh, and their complaint is that Congress has not given them their pay, their pensions from fighting in this war, which is why they can't pay their debts. So really, it's the government's problem that I can't pay my debts. So who, are you, who is the government then to take away my farm? And some of the, those criticisms are legit. So what these farmers do is they unite, because I told you Bacon's Rebellion, right? When people get mad, the government's not responding to their needs. They just burn things down. Uh, Daniel Shays, and it's Shays with an S. That's why the, print, the apostrophe is here, not after the Y. His name is Daniel Shays, not Daniel Shay. Daniel Shays is going to lead a 2,000-man force that's going to begin storming community courthouses, where the foreclosure proceedings are taking place and destroying the records. Because if there's no record, this is before the internet, obviously, and before good record keeping. If you don't have record of the fact that I owe money, then I don't owe money. So they're going to go to, to, to stop the foreclosures by shutting down these courts and destroying the records to stop the foreclosures. And the people of Massachusetts are like, whoa, these guys are wild. Somebody should stop them, right? So Massachusetts turns to the national government and says, like, hey, can you like send that army to like shut down this rebellion? And the government's like, let me tell you a little secret. We don't we don't really have one of those those army things. We don't really, we don't really have one. Massachusetts is like, well then what should we do? Can you make an army? All right? And the article is government's like, well, I mean we could try, but we don't have any money to pay an army, so you got you're kinda on your own. Good luck, Massachusetts. So in Massachusetts, the, the ruling class in Massachusetts has to like pool their money from private sources to hire a militia, which is like a little state military, to put down this rebellion, to arrest the leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And what this shows people in the nation, in Massachusetts specifically, is like, man, we had a really big problem that needed a national government to solve it, and the national government was unable to solve that problem. Maybe we need a stronger national government. So this virtual like civil war in Massachusetts between the farmers and, and the, the elites, the rich, demonstrates really that, that we need a government with a little more teeth. We need a government that's able to enforce order uh, and it convinces people to maybe get on board that maybe a strong national government isn't as scary and what's scarier is uncontrolled masses uh, without any constraints on them. Uh, a fun picture here. We have this this drawing of them about to storm this courthouse. 
Uh, we have another courthouse being stormed over here. These rebels uh, are, are participating in Shay's Rebellion. Uh, as you can see, they're just going town to town to town uh, uh, and then eventually are shut down. But it's Shay's Rebellion that, that demonstrates to many Americans, kind of like the Intel Blacks did, that there was no turning back from England. In this case, it demonstrates to a lot of Americans that maybe, maybe looking at our government and finding a new solution might be the best idea. Now, the best quote I can give you uh, is at the, the end of here. Uh, George Washington, who of course was in charge of the Continental Army that won the Revolutionary War, he writes a letter in which he asks this, have, have we fought for this? Like we fought a whole Revolutionary War against England for, for this? For this chaos and turmoil and terrible, like this, this is all we fought for? He asks, was it with these expectations that we launched into a sea of trouble? Is this what we were expecting to have when we went through all that trouble to become independent? And in this, he's implying that if this is not what we were expecting, then it's our job to change it. And that is exactly what we'll do this week in our live session. Have a great rest of your Monday. Don't forget to fill out your form real quick. Give me some good responses that demonstrate that you really thought about the things that I talked about. Uh, and I really look forward to our live sessions this week. Y'all take care. Thanks again for the time. Love you. See you soon.